Hello everybody, this is Dr. Christopher White and in this presentation we're going to continue looking at earthquakes and the Earth's interior. So in this video we're going to focus on some of the major earthquakes that have occurred in North America and this is going to correspond to section 12.8 of your textbook. So in front of us you can see we clearly have an image of the United States and onto this image we have superimposed the position of earthquake activity in the form of these yellow circles. Now straight away I dare say you have spotted there is a substantial difference in the amount of earthquake activity when you compare the eastern side of the United States to the western side of the United States. So the first question we need to answer is, well, why is the western side of the United States so active with regard to earthquakes? Well, the most obvious reason is that the western side of the United States is tectonically quite active. In comparison, the eastern side of the United States is tectonically quite stable. Now, why is the western side of the United States so tectonically active? Well, to answer that question, we need to go all the way back and, uh, to the Jurassic. So during the Jurassic, the Cretaceous and the early Cenozoic, the Paleocene to be exact, the western side of the United States was a subduction zone. It was an ocean continent subduction zone. Now, obviously, we know that ocean continent subduction zones are related to mountain building events. And so the area which we generally refer to as the Rocky Mountains was produced in response to three separate orogenic events, the Nevadian orogeny, the Siva orogeny and the Laramide orogeny. And of course, this ended up forming a very broad mountain range, which we generally refer to as the Rockies. Now, this helps to explain why there's so much faulting in this area, because, of course, compressional tectonics is going to produce extensive uh, thrust and reverse faulting. Now, once the Laramide orogeny had finished in the early Cenozoic, the area actually underwent a period of extension. And so the, this area, this meant that faults were what we call remobilized, so they were used again. And some, no, uh, some new normal faults were also created as the crust went and extended itself. And so once again, you can see that we have a situation where we've initially started off with an area of rock that's being compressed, leading to thrusting and reverse faulting. And then once the compression stops the area went in extended and this led to some normal faulting so the area is extremely heavily faulted but wait it gets even worse so when the uh, subduction finished along the western coast here the uh, the boundary changed from being a uh, convergent plate boundary to being a transform plate boundary and of course we know this transform plate boundary quite well because it tends to be given the name the San Andreas fault and so you can quite clearly see we have substantial earthquake activity here along the eastern coast of California. So this is the San Andreas Fault. This is a transform plate boundary. And so obviously we have a, you know, a, a number of strike slip faults running parallel to each other along this general trend, which we can see here. And so once again, that's going to lead to abundant earthquake activity within the region surrounding the transform plate boundary. Now, earthquake activity up here in what's called the Cascade region also continued uh, once the Laramide orogeny had finished. So this area up here is still an ocean continent convergent plate boundary. So we have the Juan de Fuca plate, which is the oceanic crust located over here, subducting underneath the North American plate here. And this leads to a string of volcanoes which uh, stretch from Northern California, through Oregon, through Washington State, and up into British Columbia, which is part of Canada. And so that's due to subduction. So you can see that the western side of the United States has been very seriously tectonically deformed. It's been very recently tectonically deformed, and the area is still tectonically active. And so because it's tectonically active, we have lots of stress being emplaced into the rocks of this area, and that's obviously going to encourage earthquakes. Now, there are a couple of other areas which are of interest uh, for North America. Now, sticking on the western side of North America, you will also notice that the area surrounding Yellowstone National Park is quite a hotspot for earthquake activity. So why is that? Well, this area is on the whole quite tectonically active when it, uh, inactive when it comes to faulting. What's actually producing the earthquakes in this area 
is magma movement. So we know there is a hotspot located underneath Yellowstone National Park. And so that means there is magma moving in the subsurface. And this magma movement is going to lead to earthquakes being generated. There's also a very large magma chamber located underneath Yellowstone National Park, and that's actually filling up at the moment. So as the magma chamber fills up, it applies stresses to the rocks around it, because as the magma chamber gets larger, it starts to push the rocks which are along its margin outwards, essentially like inflating a balloon. And obviously, that's going to lead to increased earthquake activity as well. So we can see that the western side of the United States is extremely tectonically active. So what about the eastern side? Well, you can see there is a general trend of earthquakes, it's not a particularly strong one, going in an approximately northeasterly, southwesterly direction. So these earthquakes are related to faults which were produced as part of the Appalachian orogeny, which ended up forming the Appalachian Mountains. And you can see the trace of these mountains here on this picture right there. So the formation of the Appalachian Mountains was the result of several smaller orogenies which occurred between the Ordovician and the Permian, and eventually uh, led to the largest of the orogenies, which was the uh, Alleghenian orogeny, and that occurred during the Carboniferous and Permian, and that uh, produced a set of mountains which would have been a approximately similar in size to the Himalayas. So imagine a, a, Himalayas, a Himalayan scale set of mountains running approximately along this trend here. Now obviously this amount of deformation is going to lead to substantial amounts of faulting of the crust. Now even though the mountains themselves have pretty much been completely eroded away, these faults which were present in the deeper crust are still there and every once in a while one of these faults will move producing an earthquake. Now, the final area which is of interest is the New Madrid area, and this is a particularly interesting region. Now, you'll notice the New Madrid area is actually quite tectonically active, and the area in question is given a, a, its own special name, which is the New Madrid Seismic Zone. Now, if you look at new, the New Madrid area, you'll notice straight away that it's, you know, relatively central in North America. It's well away from any plate boundaries, so you would naturally assume it should be a very tectonically boring area. There shouldn't really be much going on. However, as we can see, there's quite a lot of earthquake activity in this area, so the question we have to ask is why is this? Well, the reason behind it is because this area has something referred to as the real foot rift running through it. Now, the real foot rift formed about 600 million years ago, and it's a failed continental divergent plate boundary. So about 600 million years ago, so this is going to be the late Precambrian, North America made an attempt to tear itself in two. And it did this by forming a continental rift valley, a bit like the East African rift valley, which is forming at the moment. And so we ended up forming a big, long, linear rift valley, a big long linear trench, which ran approximately northeast to southwest, and it cut through the area which is now New Madrid. Now, because this area was under extension due to the rifting, it created very large normal faults. And these normal faults are still present in the basement rocks of the area. And it's believed that these normal faults are the cause of the earthquake activity that we can see in this area. Now, the movement of the faults is a little bit uncertain. Why they're moving is not completely clear. It could be because the rift valley that formed filled up with a mixture of Paleozoic sediments and also some Mesozoic material as well. And so the weight of all these sedimentary rocks pushing down on the basement could cause these faults to move. And of course, we know this area is having sediment actively deposited on it uh, as part of the Mississippi uh, River Valley Basin. And so sediment deposition, which is taking place in this area, will be steadily adding more and more weight onto these faults down in the basement, and that could encourage them to move. There's also the possibility that the movement of the faults could possibly be due to uh, other tectonic forces which are focused in this area. However, the actual origin of those tectonic forces is a little bit uncertain. So the moral of the story is, is we're not 100% sure why the faults in this area move, but we believe the fault movement itself is probably related to the presence of the real foot rift, and this formed about 600 
500 million years ago. So this is another one of these classic examples where faults which were formed a very, very long time ago can be reactivated and lead to earthquakes in the present day. So what are some of the major earthquakes that have actually taken place in North America? So for each of the pictures that I'm going to show you, you'll notice there's a number in orange, that's the Richter magnitude of the earthquake, and there's also a number in red, that's the number of people that were killed by the earthquake. So in 1994, there was a 6.7 earthquake, so a pretty strong one uh, in Northridge, and this led to uh, quite substantial damage. And you can see it very nicely here, especially in the uh, with regards to the road network. You can see how this particular bridge has quite clearly failed in response to the earthquake. Now, on the whole, considering the size of the earthquake and the fact it occurred in a relatively built up area, the fact that only 57 people died is, uh, is the result probably of relatively rigorous building codes. Remember, once again, the better the buildings are constructed, the less likely they are to fail during an earthquake event. Now, arguably, the earthquake that's had the highest death toll in recent history has been the Mexico City earthquake from 1985. Now, that was an eight on the Richter scale, so it's a very big earthquake, and it ended up killing about nine and a half thousand people. Now, the thing about Mexico City is that it is located in an old lake or on an old lake and so underneath the city and underneath the city there is a bowl shaped feature which was the lake and that's filled up with sediment and obviously the city is built on top of that sediment now when this particular earthquake occurred what happened was is the bowl shape of the old lake underneath the city helped to cause the seismic waves to be reflected about inside this bowl-like feature. So the waves didn't just pass through as they would normally do. So they, they would normally go, let's say, east to west, for instance, and they would be gone. Instead, what happened was, is because of this bowl-shaped feature underlying Mexico City, the seismic waves went and bounced, bounced around inside it. And so this helped to essentially make the earthquake considerably more damaging than it otherwise might have been. At the same time, it's also occurring in a very densely populated area, and it was also occurring in 1985 when building cones weren't quite as good as they are now. And so this combination of the fact that the, uh, the geology of the area helped to... Um, focus the seismic waves uh, in the area around Mexico City and the fact that you're dealing with a heavily populated area with you know building codes which were by 1985 standards probably pretty good but by modern standards probably not that great uh, helps to explain why uh, you had this you know very substantial loss of life. Now, arguably the largest earthquake that's ever occurred in North America was the 1964 Alaska earthquake. And this one was a 9.2 on the Richter scale. It was a real monster. However, it only resulted in 125 people dying. So the obvious question is, why is this? And it's a relatively simple question to answer. The earthquake itself, despite being extremely large, occurred in an area with a relatively sparse population density. There weren't that many people in the area in the first place who could be affected by this earthquake. And so that helps to you know, explain, and when you compare it to Mexico City, you can see the difference that population density makes. You can have an absolutely huge earthquake occurring in an area of a relatively low population density and it won't kill too many people. In contrast, you can have a regular earthquake occurring in an area where you have a very high population density and it can lead to a very high death toll. Now we also have the Hebgen Lake um, uh, earthquake which was from 1959. This was a, no, a 7.5 earthquake so pretty large and it only killed 26 people. Once again this is because it occurred in a relatively sparse area. So you can see the area itself is relatively mountainous and obviously this you know means population density isn't going to be that high. Now the Hebgen Lake uh, earthquake is interesting in the fact that it actually ended up triggering an extremely large landslide that we can see right here. And this landslide was so large, it actually went and blocked the river valley, which you can see running through here. And so it ended up causing a lake to build up behind it. This lake is actually called Earthquake Lake. Now, one of the better known earthquakes that's occurred in North America is the San Francisco earthquake in 1906. And by the way, just uh, while, I, while I remember, this number here should say 3000, not 300. That's a mistake on my part. Uh, 
Now, this earthquake was very large. It was an eight on the Richter scale, so it was very powerful. And of course, it was occurring in 1906. So building standards wouldn't really have included um, anything about earthquake survival. Now, in terms of the buildings themselves, you had a mixture of wooden buildings and brick and mortar buildings. The wooden buildings actually did quite well during this earthquake because the wood is able to flex a little bit. So as the earthquake took place, these buildings would shake, but the damage was lessened by the fact that the wood would also move with the earthquake and that helped to keep the building stable. In contrast, the buildings that were made from brick and mortar were far more rigid. However, they didn't have any of the kinds of reinforcement that we would have now. So, for instance, they wouldn't have, you know, they wouldn't have had steel rods inserted into the walls to help increase the wall's strength. So this meant that during the earthquake, these brick and mortar walls failed and it led to numerous building collapses. Now, these building collapses also led to large amounts of rubble being uh, strewn about the area, as you can see in this picture. And then on top of that, there was a very, very large fire which followed. And because you had all this rubble all over the place, which was a mixture of bricks and mortar and wood, well, that meant you had a, a, you know, a lot of fl uh, flammable material which went up when this fire started. So it ended up also killing people uh, due to uh, the fire which followed the earthquake itself. The final earthquake we're going to look at is the Charleston earthquake, and now this one is Charleston, South Carolina, and this one occurred in 1886. Now, in terms of the population density, it you know it is a major population center, but at that particular time, the population density was nowhere near as high as it is now. So that goes some way to explaining how this quite large earthquake, which was a 7.3, only ended up killing about 125 people. Now you can see damage was caused. You can see building collapses here and once again just like the San Francisco earthquake in 1906 the vast majority of the damage is going to be associated with these brick and mortar buildings which don't have reinforced walls. Once again the wooden buildings in this area would actually have been more likely to survive to some degree because the wood would be able to move with the shaking induced by the earthquake. Now, the Charleston earthquake is actually quite an interesting one because we're not actually 100% sure what caused it. It might have been due to fault movement, which was associated with faults which were produced by the Appalachian orogeny, but we're not 100% sure about that. And so this could be another situation where ancient faults are being reactivated in recent times and leading to earthquakes occurring. Now, the map that you can see here is a earthquake hazard map for the eastern side of the United States. And you'll notice that the earthquake risk is focused almost exclusively in two main areas. There is the New Madrid area, which we discussed on the previous slide. And between uh, 1811 and 1812, there were three very, very large earthquakes which occurred in this area. And we've discussed the probable reason for these earthquakes was fault movement, and these faults were probably produced by the real foot rift. The largest of these earthquakes was about an eight on the Richter scale, so it was very, very substantial. However, at that particular time, the area was not very densely populated, so the loss of life was limited by that factor. In the modern world, the area is now far more heavily populated. However, because the area isn't really known for extensive earthquake activity, the buildings in this area are not really reinforced for earthquake survival. And so there is the possibility that if there was to be a very large earthquake in the New Madrid seismic zone, it could now lead to a very significant loss of life. The other area is the area surrounding Charleston, South Carolina, which is the area where we had this earthquake in 1886. And you can see that there is quite a high earthquake hazard risk in this area as well. As we've discussed, the cause for this earthquake risk is not exactly clear. It's probably faulting related to the Appalachian orogeny, but that's not 100% certain. Once again, though, just like the area um, around New Madrid, you have a situation where this particular region is relatively uh, low in strong earthquake activity. And so a lot of the buildings in this area are not designed for earthquake survivability. And so once again, if there was another very large earthquake in the Charleston area, there is a very real risk of a substantial loss of life.
Alright, thank you for watching everybody and have a good day.